So I finally caved, you guys have got what you wanted. Today, we're gonna watch the film that literally everyone is talking about, Under Paris. This French Netflix film has taken the world by storm. I can't believe the amount of people that have been begging me to do a movie commentary on it. I have to say, I'm kind of excited to watch this one, mainly because the film got a big thumbs up from the king of horror, our pal Steven. Based on some of your comments, I'm pretty sure I'm gonna be nailing this one for some of its scientific inaccuracies. Remember though guys, even though I'm probably gonna be tearing this film to shreds, it is a movie commentary, so it's just a bit of fun. Right, okay, enough jabbing on. It's time to grab your favorite beverage, sit back, relax, and enjoy this movie commentary of Under Paris with the real life shark scientist. Interesting start here then, we've got a supposed quote from Darwin, but they suffix it by saying it's based on Darwin. You can't have something in quotes if the person didn't actually say those words. Fun fact to start you off, turns out Darwin never said this. It was actually made up slash paraphrased by a business professor from Louisiana in 1963. Good start under Paris. So we start here somewhere in the North Pacific Ocean at the infamous Great Pacific Garbage Patch, described by many online to be the eighth continent. Thankfully though, with those coordinates they've handily provided for us, we can input exactly where they are, which turns out to be a couple of hundred miles off the coast of San Diego. Now, let me ask the San Diego viewers at home, are you guys seeing mountains and mountains of plastic bottles and bags like we're seeing here washing up on your beaches? Probably not, right? And that's because the Great Pacific Garbage Patch is probably one of the biggest misconceptions out there. It is isn't an island sized floating patch of garbage like you can see here. Instead, about 94% of it is made up from microplastics, which are tiny, tiny pieces of plastic that are broken down from the larger bits. The rest of it is mainly abandoned fishing gear and not plastic bags or plastic bottles. You're gonna have to trust me on this one, guys. My entire master's thesis was about how plastics impact sharks across the world. So while it is still bad, it's not this level of bad. Who started letting me ramble on about plastics? Anyway, the team sends some divers underneath the garbage and they've just discovered what looks to be an entangled and of course dead whale with a whacking great bite mark out of it. Not really the best thing to be hanging around while you're underwater, but if you fancy having a pretty bad run in with a shark, this is high on the list of situations where that might happen. This shark comes in for a quick pass and everyone cacks their pants, me included, but it turns out that these are apparently mako sharks. They kind of look more like great whites to me, but I guess actually doing a CGI mako wasn't in the budget. They do make a comment here about it being strange that these makos are pack hunting and that they normally wouldn't be doing this. What they're ignoring here though, for some reason, is the massive blubbery free meal that's oozing blood. They're not pack hunting, they're probably scavenging off that whale carcass. I suppose it is somewhat rare to see Mako scavenging on a whale carcass, but it does happen on occasion. Most of the time it'll be white sharks or tigers, but sharks in general very rarely pass up on the opportunity for a free nutrient rich meal like a dead whale. Mako's included. After a few minutes, the big mama Mako shows up and the scientists are shocked at her massive size, so decide to take an in-water blood sample. This does happen in the shark science world, but normally after you've done it, that shark is gonna be out of there so quickly and you're likely not gonna see it again. But big mama decides that she doesn't really fancy being poked with a sharp stick and proceeds to obliterate every single diver that's in the water. The French marine biologist Sophia decides to jump in to help everyone without any breathing apparatus or free diving fins and then confronts the shark with a spear gun. She somehow gets snagged by the shark and some marine debris and is eventually dragged to the depths of the Pacific Ocean. After saying goodbye to her eardrum, she frees herself, but it turns out she was only like 10 meters from the surface. <laughs> what? And I... One pathetic soap story later. Anyway, fast forward three years into the future, Sophia's eardrums have miraculously repaired themselves and she now gives presentations about the ocean in public aquariums. The internet says your whole team was eaten by sharks, is that true? And gets bullied by school kids. What a fall from grace. We do get some nice shots of aquarium sharks in the background though. And if you wanted to learn a little bit more about which sharks do well in aquariums, then make sure you give that video in the top right a click. At the end of her talk, Sophia is persuaded to join a blue haired teenage girl who reveals a secret hideout of eco vigilantes hell bent on saving the sharks and the ocean. Despite having no qualifications or experience in working with large apex marine predators, the eco warriors have hacked into a tracking system and are saving sharks from fishing trawlers, I think. 
They haven't really explained it, but that kind of looks like what they're doing. I like here though, how they've just flat out copied the layout of the Osearch shark tracker to the most minute detail. They've even got the same little shark icons and yellow track lines. <laughs> The vigilantes have also managed to track Big Mama Mako, aka Lilith, who appears to have completed the longest triple oceanic migration ever. Hold on, let me get this right. She swum from the Pacific Ocean down to Australia, across the Indian Ocean, round South Africa, up the west coast of Africa, into the northeast Atlantic, and up the f***ing Sen. <laughs> <laughs> and the explanation we get for this world record breaking mega migration is With the effects of climate change and pollution, the sharks have completely changed their behavior. Climate change and pollution. That's it. That's all we get. The shark's just like, oh shit, a plastic bottle. My behavior's all confused. I guess I'll just swim 20,000 miles and end up in the River Sen. <laughs> so pollution causing rain shifts like this is nonsense. But there is a little bit of truth to the climate change stuff. Kind of. Climate change is going to cause rain shifts for different shark species who are going to start to move to waters where previously they couldn't survive, but it's not going to happen like we're seeing here. <laughs> Growing increasingly concerned, Sophia reports to the River Police that there's a massive shark in the Seine that's about to mince up a lot of people. And the chief of River Police is like, well, there's sharks in the Thames. How bad could it be? She's absolutely correct, to be fair here. There are sharks in the Thames somehow. But those shark species in the Thames are taupe and smooth hounds, two species that are completely harmless to humans. What they're not is an unusually massive mako shark that has traveled tens of thousands of miles to get there. Anyway, the chief of river police wants some more cold, hard evidence before she sounds the alarm bells, as if the sunken car with giant tooth marks and mangled up friendly homeless guy wasn't enough already. But the highly irritating eco warriors, terrified that the river police are now gonna kill the shark, decide that they're gonna turn off the shark's tracking device. Nice work, dweebs. In an attempt to do their best just stop oil impression, the eco warrior vigilantes put out a social media plea to the youth masses, asking everyone to come down into the flooded Paris catacombs and save this shark, because saving this shark then sends a message that they're gonna save the ocean or something. I'm not sure I'm quite there on the logic for this one, but each to their own. So they head down into the catacombs and the head eco warrior plans to use this pulsating floating buoy to lure the shark back to the ocean. As to why she's actively jumped into the water to swim with the shark that she knows has killed a guy from a sunken car without putting on a mask, snorkel, and fins, I have no idea. That's a surefire recipe to lose a limb. Big Mama Mako eventually arrives, and this time she's got company. Turns out she's had a little shark pup. Sophia, the apparent marine biologist, claims that they've invaded the shark's nest, as if sharks are like these little birds hunkering down in a nice safe place to give birth to their young. Sharks don't have nests, guys. I think the main thing here, though, is that they've shown the mother and the baby shark swimming together, which is sort of suggesting that sharks display an element of parental care, which is, of course, nonsense. When shark pups are born, they are completely independent and receive no care from either parent. They just end up swimming off, trying to find somewhere safe where they're not going to get rinsed by any larger predators. Anyway, head honcho eco warrior gives us this beautiful line. Wake the hell up. They won't hurt anyone. Before she is duly ripped to shreds by the shark. I honestly don't think I've wanted a film character to get eaten so badly than this girl right here. <laughs> Fair play to the actor and the writers for making her that annoying. Pure carnage of course ensues as the eco-vigilantes all get what they deserve, slipping into the water left, right and centre. People are coming out with no legs. This is the chaos that I have waited nearly an hour for and I am all for it. I think the broad lesson we've probably learned from all of this is something along the lines of stop touching sharks, kids. So after heading to the mayor to report this mass death event and to try and get the triathlon stopped, the mayor does her best Larry Vaughan impression from Jaws and decides that the triathlon is definitely still going to go ahead. Mr. Prefect, hush this up immediately. Nothing can get out. Hang on a minute. Hush this up. You're telling me that somehow this dude has got to cover up the fact that 12 people have literally just been ripped to shreds by sharks and another 40 or so people have just witnessed it, not including the doctors and the nurses that are treating them in the hospital, and you're just there like, nah, didn't happen. Don't know what you're talking about. This is ridiculous. So they ended up managing to retrieve one of the young sharks from the catacombs and Sophia the marine biologist is performing a necropsy to try and understand a little bit more about what's going on with these sharks. You see that? These organs allow the shark to adapt to the salinity of the water. Right, stop. If you guys thought the science up to this point was bad, 
This right here is the icing on the cake. She's saying here that the nasal flaps allow the shark to adapt to the salinity of the water and the a bit on the side has shown that she adapted to fresh water. And they've just completely made that up. The nasal flaps on sharks have nothing to do with salinity, nor are they an adaptation to allow sharks to live in fresh water. They're actually used for smelling or more scientifically, chemoreception, which is the ability for a shark to detect chemicals or molecules within that water. The real organs that are responsible for adapting some sharks to fresh water are the liver and the kidneys. The kidney produces urine which can remove salts or excess water and then the liver produces urea as and when it's required depending on the salinity of the environment. I feel like the directors here have just been like yeah we need to point to something on the body of this shark that explains why it's now swimming in fresh water. I don't know let's just point to these flappy looking bits on the front of the face. So the necropsy also revealed that the shark was apparently a new species and it was reproducing via parthenogenesis although they didn't really choose to elaborate on that at all. So in order to stop this army of rapidly growing virgin birthing killer sharks, they talk through their brilliant plan that's definitely not going to work, which of course involves plenty of explosives, cool speedboats, and this funky set of DJ decks referred to as an infrasound emitter. Infrasound is sound produced outside of the range of human hearing. It's a pretty low frequency, probably below about 1 hertz. Sharks, on the other hand, are most sensitive to sounds below 100 hertz. Some studies have pointed towards 20 hertz being particularly attractive to sharks, so why they're using a device that goes so much lower than that I'm not sure. They might as well have just played some heavy death metal music through an underwater speaker. They really don't need those fancy DJ decks. And yes, heavy death metal music has been shown to attract sharks. It sort of mimics the low frequency pulses that a dying fish might make. And if you really enjoyed that fact, make sure you hit that like button. Meanwhile, the mayor gleefully starts the triathlon knowing full well, all of these people are about to die. All right. At the same time, the river police team and their infrasound emitter plan starts to go horribly wrong as all the newly born baby sharks don't really seem to like the sound. I told you, you should have played heavy death metal music. Come back, Enema! Is this guy's name Enema? Hang on, hang on, we gotta rewind that. Come back, Enema! <laughs> it does sound like they're saying Enema. Oh man. That is a really unfortunate name to have. Thankfully, before he was devoured by the hungry baby sharks, Enema managed to set off the bomb to entomb the sharks forever. Up top, after the explosion, the other river police decide to do a speedboat spin for no particular reason and just end up in exactly the same place as they were before. Not entirely convinced that her own plan has actually worked, Sophia heads back down to check whether the sharks really have been entombed in the catacombs, and of course they haven't, as Big Mama Lilith bursts through the rocks now she's mad. She does a kick-ass flip of the river police boat, sending them flying into the water and decides that she's now going to eat these two river police officers. That's what you get for doing a pointless boat spin. I hope you're happy. With a shot here very reminiscent of the jaw shark and its big yellow barrels, Big Mama Lilith heads towards the unsuspecting swimmers to begin enacting her revenge on the citizens of Paris for blowing up all her kids. If we pause it just here though... <laughs> <laughs> we can see just how big this shark has now got. It's getting towards Megalodon size. What a unit. Compared to like 30 seconds before where she still looks to be about 18 feet long, she's got to be like 25 foot long now. That is a fast growing shark. Eventually the military decide that they're now going to get involved and unleash a flurry of bullets towards Lilith. This sniper here has some pretty impressive underwater vision to pop a bullet in her from here and it all just suddenly gets very chaotic. Little do they know, the bottom of the Seine is actually littered with active World War II shells. You'd think during the entire process of cleaning up the Seine so that it was safe to swim in that someone might have thought, maybe we should take out these bombs, right? Nah, it'll be fine. <laughs> maybe not. So in a chain reaction event, all the unexploded World War II shells explode, which somehow causes a giant tsunami from somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> and that completely obliterates everyone and everything in its path, including that wretched mayor. Yeah, she definitely deserved that. Marine biologist Sophia and her handsome river police officer survived the tsunami and somehow managed to make it on top of a building before it's then revealed that all of the baby sharks survived the explosions and have now taken over an entirely submerged Paris. Oh shit, have the sharks won? I think they've won. We've been waiting years for this on a Shark Bites movie commentary and it's finally happened. What a time to be alive. And there we go, guys. That was Under Paris. Wow. 
Where do we start there then? Do you know what? I actually quite enjoyed that. It did take a little while to get going, but once it got there, it was exactly how you expect a cheesy shark film to be. I have to say though, some of the science in that film was absolutely dreadful. They just downright made things up and tried to pass them off as if they were real. So for that reason, its realism score is definitely getting a one, but for overall entertainment, I'll give it a six. What did you guys think of Under Paris? Did you love it? Did you hate it? Make sure you let me know below. But before you head off, if you fancy watching another shark film with me, then you might quite like this video right here. In it, I watched Shark Night, which is of course ridiculous as all shark movies are, but like the film we just watched, it is still relatively entertaining. So make sure you give it a click here.